Well, Dynasty Warriors 4 Empires is certainly a weird one. It was a really interesting experience when it first released that mixed the core gameplay of Dynasty Warriors with elements more commonly found in strategy games akin to Koei's original baby, The Romance of the Three Kingdoms, or the Total War series. With such an interesting mix of actions and light strategy elements, was Dynasty Warriors 4 Empires an experience worth trying out? And how has the game held up now that almost two decades have passed and a dozen Empire sequels have been made to refine the experience? Let's find out. Dynasty Warriors 4 Empires was released roughly one year after the original game, and only about six months after the game's first expansion, Dynasty Warriors 4 Extreme Legends. Like Extreme Legends, Dynasty Warriors 4 Empires is a standalone experience. However, unlike previous Extreme Legends installments, the Empire's content cannot be remixed with the other builds of the subseries. In fact, it's probably better to think of the Empire's games as spin-offs rather than actual expansions. There's enough changes introduced to make them have a distinct feeling of their own that isn't replicated by the mainline games. In Empires, you choose a character to act as a faction leader with the goal of unifying all of China. Although the frantic hack and slash action of the Musou games is present here, the focus has been shifted more towards diplomacy and strategy. Many of the actual battles can be skipped or automated, and you have the freedom to go about expanding your territory and choosing your battles at your own pace within reason. You still do have a time limit of 100 turns for unifying the country, but it's very rare that a playthrough will get anywhere near the hard time cut off. The gameplay is broken up into two major gameplay types, a political phase and a battle phase. The political phase takes place in between battles. Here, you're able to look at an overworld map containing the entirety of China, which is separated into roughly 25 zones. You're able to view which forces currently control different zones of China, see potential items that can be made in these areas, review your revenue from the zones you control and pay revenue for policy upkeep and enactable mandates, view your own force structure and numbers of infantry, forge alliances, and most importantly, enact policies that greatly affect how the game plays out. During each political phase, you are given the option of choosing two policies together from four sets proposed at random from officers under you, or rejecting all of them. Policies range from a handful of categories, including officer affairs, rest, product development, military, diplomacy, government, and battle tactics. Policies under the officer affairs category allow you to promote or improve your officers and generals. You also have the ability to search for individuals of worth within your lands to recruit or to have enemy generals defect to your calls. Rest policies can restore troops to your forces since forces killed during battle do not revive at the end of a stage and it takes time to regenerate your armies. Product development allows you to do exactly what the name implies, develop your products. All regions have their own unique items that can be made, from mounts to orbs to equipable items. Military policies allow you to improve the strength of your armies, allowing you to use more advanced weaponry such as fire arrows or juggernauts on the battlefield. With diplomatic policies, you can forge either short or long alliances with other forces, which last four or eight turns, respectively. Diplomacy also allows for improvement of commerce in your regions. Government policies allow your force leader to enact mandates that affect your controlled regions, ranging from tax collection to military drafts. Finally, battle tactics include any other policies that directly affect the game's battle phase, and include starting with more bases under your control or procuring reinforcements during your next attack. These strategies have very large effects on your armies. If you repeatedly accept any individual officer strategies, they may be promoted to your strategist, which grants you greater benefits for using them during the game's battle phase. There's a great mix of policies that are enactable here. Unfortunately, I also have several gripes with these policies that were fortunately fixed in later entries. It would have been nice if you could have chosen your own proposals from a list of all possible actions. There were many times where I would just outright reject enacting any policies, as nothing was overwhelmingly to my advantage and would just result in me wasting what little gold I had. It's also a bit annoying that you have to choose any of the four sets of officer proposals together. Do you want to accept the Lubu's proposal to restore forces to a key officer who has no troops, but don't want to enact his other, much dumber and more expensive policy? Tough luck, the policies are a package deal. It was serviceable at the time of the game's release, but taking the sequels into account, this aspect of the game just hasn't aged well. There's also something of a light morale system in the game's political phase, determined by your enacted policies and mandates. Depending on your choices in governing and tax collecting, you may become richer but be seen as a tyrant by your subjects, which may result in a revolt by your officers. Other policies don't result in higher amounts of income or even reduced income, but keep the individuals under you content and happy. As gold is hard to come by in the early to middle stages of the game, and all policies require it to some degree, 
You have to walk a fine line with your taxation and spending in order to keep your armies at peak performance and implementing the best policies, while keeping those under you from revolting from dissatisfaction. It isn't as deep as a lot of strategy games out there, but it is serviceable here. The other major phase found in the game is much more akin to the rest of the series, where battles take place. Before a battle, you are able to select up to three generals and three lieutenants that will appear during the fighting. You are able to recruit a total of 10 generals and 10 lieutenants to your force, and any of these 20 characters can be directly used by you in the battles, allowing you to play as generic NPCs for the first time. During a battle, you have either 15 minutes to defend your region, or 30 minutes to conquer a region if you're invading. Running out of time during a defense results in a victory, while one during an invasion results in a loss. These times can be tweaked into the game's political phase by enacting specific policies. During offensive battles, your goal is to capture the opposing faction's enemy camp or rout their leader. Although you can run straight to the enemy's main camp, you probably would not be able to capture it without also taking the majority of blinked enemy bases throughout the map. During defensive battles, you similarly can gain victory by taking out the leader of the opposing force or again surviving until the time runs out. As previously alluded to, each battleground is made up of a series of linked zones and camps, which are currently under your control and which are under the enemies can be seen by the color of the surrounding areas. Blue denotes those regions under your control, and red denotes the enemy zones. A game's battle phase essentially focuses on controlling as many of these zones as possible, and zones can be acquired by eliminating enemy officers in the zone and killing all other generic forces, consisting of multiple melee units and usually a projectile unit protecting each base. If an officer is defeated in battle, they'll usually respawn at their force's capital after a set amount of time and resume their assault. If an officer is defeated three times, or occasionally defeated deep within your own territory, they can be captured and recruited to your force, assuming you have the gold to pay for them. Otherwise, they're released, usually resulting in them returning to their original factions. It would have been nice if there were more options such as executions as seen in the Total War Three Kingdoms game, but again, considering this is an action game first and a strategy game second, it isn't really that big of a deal. Although a bit simple for its time, Battles in Dynasty Warriors 4 Empires were a fun twist on the typical Dynasty Warriors formula. I think the combat in the game is more than serviceable, as Empires essentially retains the core combat of Dynasty Warriors 4, even if there are some oversimplifications of stages and a few subtle improvements would increase my personal enjoyment immensely. The ultimate goal of Empires is to unite the land, which is done by alternating through your strategic choices in the political phase and combat prowess during the actual battles. Overall, I think the game succeeded at making quite the enjoyable hook at the time of its release, and its plethora of Empire sequels suggests I'm not the only one that believes this. The game is highly replayable, with a set of different starting scenarios that begin at different times during the Three Kingdoms period. There's also a fictional mode, where officer locations and factions are randomized, ensuring each playthrough of Empire mode is a unique experience. The game also ships with some side content and character art and model galleries for those that are interested. Although the game's music and graphics are mostly identical to the other games in the other Dynasty Warriors 4 games, Japanese voices are again introduced to the English versions of the game, which is nice for those that want them. There is now also a very expansive gallery that ships with the game, where character bios can be read, and all character voices, model animations, and costumes can be viewed at your leisure. Versus mode returns with four new stages, and this time can be played against a computer opponent, if you're like me and have no friends in real life to play with. Courses include Vanquish, where you attempt to defeat more enemies than your opponent, Pilfer, where you attempt to score more points by finding items around a map and bringing them to a merchant to sell. Melee, where you attempt to knock as many troops off of an elevated area as possible. And Endurance, where whoever survives the longest wins. There's a surprising amount of variety here, and the fact that all these modes are original to what is effectively a light strategy game is a pretty pleasant surprise. Edit mode also returns, with a new set of costumes that differ from the original game. Unfortunately, the original costumes are no longer available, so although the content is original, you don't have much more variety than you did previously in Dynasty Warriors 4 Extreme Legends. Dynasty Warriors 4 Empires was released exclusively on the PlayStation 2, and can be easily acquired nowadays. I sung hundreds of hours at the time of release into Empires, and at the time, I'd have considered this a must-play for Musou fans, as well as those who may want a more subtle, simple introduction to strategy games and didn't want to dive headfirst into the likes of Dynasty Tactics, Romance of the Three Kingdoms, and the Nobunaga's ambitions of the period. Sadly, I can't recommend the game today. Its gameplay is a bit too clunky and basic nowadays, and the Empire spin-offs have improved drastically since this initial release, to the point that in some scenarios I'd recommend them over the main games they're based off of. Dynasty Warriors 4 Empires was a great start, but you'll be in for a significantly better experience with virtually any other Empires game out there. Thanks for tuning into my review of Dynasty Warriors 4 Empires. If you liked this video, be sure to drop a like, and don't forget to subscribe for more retrospective reviews of the Musou series. Let me know your favorite moments from Dynasty Warriors or other Musou games in the comments below. Thanks for watching.